Oi. John Burbank, um, incredibly Thank excited you. to have you on camera. We've talked a lot of times in the past, but this is the first time we've able, been able to do so in public. Yeah, it's been uh, a while, too. It has been a while. We actually have not chatted all that much. And a lot has changed for you personally and also for the industry. I mean, we've talked a little bit about this in the past in terms of the, the dynamic and change. But you, know, you were one of the early individuals to bring your commodity, to bring your hedge funds focus onto the commodity space. You know, mm -hmm. and I met or fairly early on. You were very focused at that time on the emergence of China, the demand for uh, commodities and kind of the 1998 through, mm -hmm. you know, 2007, 2008 era, even as late as 2011 we talked about. Mm -hmm. And you switched really dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd just be interested to understand what the thought process was that brought that to your attention and then caused you to switch a little bit. Maybe you could talk with us about that. So what I've what I learned with markets is that um, you know price is um, could be misleading or could be telling, and you got to figure out um, in which it is. And in 2011, after being invested for 10 years in in 10 years for in energy and um, eight years in mining um, gold, I've been invested in for nine years. Um, I had this weird experience where the three commodities I was long all went up, um, uh, but the equities associated with those commodities all were down. Like gold was up 17% in 2011, and the gold equities were down 17%. Just didn't make any sense. And the top, I remember, was I think Osama bin Laden uh, uh, was killed, I believe. Um, and I also remember reading like a Wine Spectator, I think the top in Bordeaux prices was April 2011. Um, but what happened was um, there was a top in sort of things associated with growth. And I guess you could say there was a risk that was removed. But the, the spot commodity actually acted quite differently from the equities. And the equities were discounting the future or perceptions of the future. It was almost like Chinese were sellers uh, in 2011 or something but the market didn't know. And anyway, but after 10 years in evaluating post-crisis what the macro you know, situation was and how much growth could we really get out of the world, um, the, you know, Europe was a, was a challenge. Um, I just came to the conclusion like we weren't gonna get enough growth um, in the world, not enough to support it, and actually I should trust the equities and not the commodities that I was long. If you're long a commodity equity, you're really long the commodity equity. You know, you think you're long the commodity, but you're really long the, the pricing and liquidity and the equities. And um, it was very difficult. I sold, um, I sold every position I had, except for two. One was a, a refiner, and one was a specialty chemical company. I got acquired a few years later, but I just, I just got out, and I it was a real about face. And it, my team thought I was, you know kind of crazy. Um, and as I think it was a part like a, a right brain moment, I didn't know that I was right, but I thought there was a good chance I, I, I could be and I had to reevaluate the world. And so that's what I, that's what I did. And, I, and by beginning of 2012, I came up with a different conception of how I should be oriented. Because I'm always looking for what is going to be different five years from now. You know, it's just the way it works. It's like the markets are totally repriced five years later. And I thought this was the end of, a, of an era, you know, 10 years for me of being invested in commodities. And so that's where I got to a belief that human capital was what one should be long. And I was just the opposite of commodity. It's actually, I mean, it's, it, it's difficult to convey to people how hard that is for a professional investor, particularly somebody who had the, the um, industry footprint uh, as yourself, right? I mean... Your clients had heard for years right. about how commodities were, uh, you know, underappreciated investment. That, mm -hmm. you know, the dollar was a problem. That China was going to grow to the moon, et cetera. And as you mentioned, your team probably resisted quite, quite strongly. You'd probably built a team that had mining experts and mm -hmm. very little in the way of human capital. And so that was, that's a remarkable change. Um, and it also creates conditions in which, paradoxically. From an institutional standpoint, it creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty. I mean, you must have received not just pushback from your team, but your investors probably said quite sharply, what are you doing, 
right? I mean, gold is gold is at all-time highs, and oil is back to above 100 bucks a, share, uh, a barrel. Um, and these stocks are incredibly cheap if you are, think of them as investing in the commodities. I mean, Am I incorrect in that assumption, or was that was well, that something you really faced? It's it's true, but this is a left brain and a right brain activity. You know, your right brain is spotting patterns, right, and using intuition and sort of animal senses, and your left brain is logic and you know the lawyer and the accountant and the and uh, I find that um, I think I have a good mix of the two, and I find that um, there are too many people in in and investing in finance who are left brain focused and can miss you know signals, but it, I don't know. It wasn't it wasn't easy. I didn't actually have an answer for what is the what should I be doing. And, it, and but a couple of months later, I I came up with a not that I knew it was right, but it was like I think the the structure of technology and being surrounded by it here and and investing in some of it at that point, I thought the structure of technology, which is, does not mean revert. Right, and if it's like a very fast-changing thing um, with a lot of nonlinear outcomes. I thought the structure of technology was favoring the most, the, the the highest quality human capital, which is essentially the opposite of commodity. You know, the opposite of of lowest cost, you know, available commodity. And and I I I, I by by thinking about that and being around it here and knowing that the cost of Creating technology was was just getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, I came to the conception that maybe the surprise is how valuable, um, how much more valuable um, the the best, the A students in the class is what I said. That really you should just be belong the A students in the class and short the rest of the class. It doesn't matter. Whereas commodities, you know, you're looking for that, you know, something needed that has a very low cost and is you know cheap to transfer, but doesn't actually require, you know, tremendous you know ongoing sophistication. Um, and so that was like a set of ideas and thoughts that had sort of evolved and emerged. And then I realized I was, by selling, I was you know, making way for it. The biggest problem was that I ran a diverse, diverse uh, sectors and had many different teams. And I didn't decide to, you know, abandon the mining team and abandon the energy team. Um, energy peaked last in you know 2014. But anyway, but I, I do know that markets, you know, every five years look completely different than they did five years before, and security prices move so much that it's always, you know, it's this new recognition of change, and I focus on change. That's the that's the thing that you know is dependable, but it happens in different ways in different areas. And it wasn't until twenty third beginning of twenty thirteen that growth really took off, um, and. Um, and that's when tech really started to do, do better. Um, I'd say it wasn't wasn't so clear that tech was absolutely the thing to do. I think. Well, it it, it definitely wasn't. And you mentioned something that I think very few people are able to articulate as well as you just did, which is that technology is not mean reverting. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you and I both came of age, you know, um, bracketed on either side by a technology bubble, right? So mm -hmm. the 96 to 2000 time period, you and I both looked at that. Makes you think said, it's mean reverting, but that was... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, the, the assumption was that, you know, okay, well, valuation is what matters. And if we look at right. things like, uh, you know, mining companies, they were deeply neglected and therefore they yes. are value, right? Um, and they were, but mainly because of 20 years of since the top and China was coming and people didn't know. Is what ended up happening, and you know the dollar got cheaper, and there's also a place to avoid the carnage of, uh, of the tech crash. Yeah, yeah. two thousands. Yeah, no, I I think that's absolutely correct, and I think that's you know what we've what we've paradoxically seen is is that value has actually now had its longest run of underperformance. Mm -hmm. Right, it had a very brief window, basically yeah. from you know two thousand through two thousand six, in which it made up a lot of lost ground. But if you actually look at that approach to investing, yeah. it's been an unmitigated disaster yes. for you know the past 30 years. Yeah. Um, and it always sounds far more rational, right? I mean, who, who, who wouldn't be pro-value, right? I mean, who wants, who wants to be the momentum guy? That's, that makes you sound like a moron. Um, but really, there is, there, there's something deeply insightful about that idea that, that you know, mean reversion is kind of silly. And 
the idea that energy uh, as expressed by petroleum or other sources is going to be as large of a purchase a component of our purchasing basket as it was historically mm -hmm. um, is very hard for people who made a lot of money and who mm -hmm. built up a, a notable Mm -hmm. um, reputation on that basis. So y you mentioned you made this transition and you didn't abandon your teams, your mining team, etc. Um, and you were 100% right, but you know, what challenges did that create for you organizationally? I mean, how, how do you think about that transition, that decision not to just wipe the board and move on in, in a different direction? Well, part of it was you can always be short things that you were long. Um, but you do also need your team to believe in these things. And again, I had this belief, idea, that this is, was potentially a big transition. Um, and so I, was, I started to do that, be short commodities instead of long, and see them as a hedge to um, things with growth and, and more human capital. But running a diverse funds where you're, you're, you want the vol to be relatively low, it's hard to... You're, 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 and you have limits on how much you, we had limits on how much we could put in any one sector. So I, I actually had, you know, you know risk-based imposed limits on where we could put capital. And um, I would have been better off, you know, retrospectively saying, this is my belief. And, and when I validate this hypothesis, I'm just going to go do, focus on this and, you know, forget the other stuff. What I've, I, I believe that's the right thing now because I think, I think, and what I've noticed for a long time is, although the economic growth may be okay, and right now it's good, but I don't expect it to be that great. The change, the the change is actually increasing regardless of economic growth, because structurally, as tech advances, it releases new information. In fact, the new information growth is tremendous, and that new information therefore illuminates, you know, you know, creates realities and recognitions that you didn't have before. And so it changes people's behaviors. So I think now I would have been better off saying, I'm going to go with, when, you know, when I really got to believe this was the case in 2012, I'm just going to focus on this because that's, that would increase my chances of understanding it and getting return from it. But it would have added to my risk level and it would have been a meaningful, you know, meaningful change. Um, and so what I did personally was essentially start investing much more heavily with my own capital to test this hypothesis. And I, and I had a belief that San Francisco real estate was going to do really, really well. I was the biggest bull that I knew because I thought human capital is what, what really meant um, the most and the density of human capital. Human capital basically attracts other human capital. And uh, I thought, um, so I'm going to test this with my own capital and not diversify and get more feedback, more information, and see how it went. And so it did go well. I didn't put a huge amount of time into it, but I tested it with my human capital, my own personal capital. Um, and essentially what I'm doing now is essentially saying, I am not going to you know, allow the drag of things that are not uh, interesting or you know, that fit my hypothesis slow me down. I'm actually going to focus my attention, which is limited like everyone's, on what I think, uh, the hypothesis of what I think is going to be in the next five years. And so I learned I actually would have been better off abandoning more um, and betting on this you know, belief, or at least working as hard as I could to validate a hypothesis. And um, even though I know people want to put you in a box, they want you to do something repeatable, they don't really want you to divert, you know, diverge from that. Um, but markets change. They learn, you know, they learn, they reprice. And then the world is actually a different place five years later, you know, 10 years later. And tech is a, and cre globalization's created a different place. Tech's a different place. The thing that absolutely threw me, um, you know, out of this was central banking. Central banking um, essentially created a non mean reverting supply of liquidity, which you could say um, removed, you know, a certain prudency of those who are looking for changes of liquidity that create changes of price, right, and, you know, desire to be aggressive or conservative as a mean reverting thing, and allowed, in a way, this progress towards this, you know, ever-increasing tech-enabled future to happen even faster. And, um, and so the, 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 the limitations, the, the, the human limitations of not wanting to prevent that made me think, I'm not going to, you know, subject my, 
career and capital, investors' capital, to getting that you know, behavior correct when this, the, this trend in tech is only getting more powerful, right? And I, I, I find it now hard to have a discussion about almost anything without including technology as part of it. Well, let's, so why don't we do that then? Let's, um, let's wrap that up because you, you know, you've now chosen to move basically to a private office, right? So you don't accept outside well, capital not, anymore? Not completely. Not completely, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. We have, we have, we have uh, one fund, Special Opportunities Fund, that is, uh, is, is running. And we started two uh, crypto funds, uh, uh, Jan 1, a crypto dedicated fund. Uh, I do not manage it, um, but my team does. And a fund of fund, much in the way fund of funds operated in the rise of hedge funds 20 to 30 years ago. So we started doing that. They're all, they're all you know, uh, crypto funds. I can do, and I did, uh, crypto in the Special Opportunities Fund. We bought Bitcoin about a year ago. Um, but that is a more of a traditional fund. And so the Special Opportunities Fund, does that have, does that have an evergreen focus or is there a particular area that you're, you're focused on? You've been very vocal about Saudi Arabia. Yeah, so the biggest weight is in, is in Saudi. About two thirds of the NAV is in Saudi equities that are now um, gaining interest among uh, international investors. And we're waiting next month to see if MCI will include it. Um, you know, tell the market that they're going to uh, make it part of the index in the future. The FTSE has already done that. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a big moment for that. Um, but I also have um, uh, some tech exposure. I have some crypto exposure. I actually do have some mining uh, exposure because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of events uh, and it's, 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 I think it's kind of mispriced. Um, but my orientation really is around uh, when the Saudi trade is over, meaning when it's now part of what everyone owns and it's been repriced, it'll, it'll lose a lot of appeal for me in terms of owning the equities. Saudi as a society that's changing, you know, as it's liberalizing, as it's letting in the world, bringing in the world, the speed at which I think it's going to happen, that is remaining. And, um, and I'm engaged in that in a, in a variety of ways. So that's an area that, that you, know, you and I share an interest in. Um, and I would argue for somewhat similar reasons, right? I mean, the irony as you talk about this is that organizations like FTSE and MSCI and the growth of passive investing and the growth of uh, you know, uh, modern portfolio theory allocation methodologies um, have basically forced an increasing portion of the capital globally. Right into following the lead that's created by the FTSEs and the MSCIs. Basically, right. if something is included in the index, right. it can have an extraordinary impact in terms of the liquidity that flows into a previously illiquid market. Our, our data said that the year leading up to the inclusion, the passive inclusion was a, over 50%. For every, every instance, on average, it was over 50% return. Not all returns are positive, but the point is the, the anticipation of all that future liquidity leads to a lot of new capital. And that's what's starting to happen in Saudi just this, just this year. Um, so I think we have a, a really good next you know, 12 to 18 months ahead of us. And it is fortunately, you know, combined with oil being a lot higher than people expected um, and uh, the sentiment around you know, just Saudi and understanding um, is growing, which is helping obviously the allocation of capital from you know, organizations that are now I could say, not in, not interested in risk taking, you know, or or less interested in active management. This is a very active management situation. I mean, you mentioned mining, and you mentioned that there's some some unique catalysts there. You want, you want to talk about that for a second, or what's interesting in mining is the in increasing intensity of certain metals in, you know, electric vehicles or iPhones or like this, you know, increasingly electronic future. So there's actually. Um, not very much communication, or not not so much between the tech guys and the and the mining guys. Like these are the two opposite ends of the spectrum. So you take something like cobalt, you know, which is just going up and to the right. Um, you know, there are interesting situations that one can invest in with you know high expected returns. Um, even copper, like we think copper, the intensity of copper relative to the supply, the known supply of copper means copper is actually going to do pretty well. 
if you if you wait. Um, and it's easier to, you know, with a capacity constrained industry like mining, it's easier to, you know, get that down um, when you realize there's a demand driver that's independent somewhat of the economy, then it makes it, you know, makes it worth doing. So um, mining, you know, mining seems to be an asset class that is losing uh, investors. And so when you, I mean, we can find things where we think it could go up 3x or 5x if it's priced, you know, how we think. Um, it's volatile, you have to wait, you know, it's a commodity. Um, but that adds interest. And I think what I've decided to do there in this fund is to abandon, you know, trying to be, trying to limit risk and to really, the, the answer, at least for, for me in public managed funds, is to, is to size up what I think are superior risk rewards and, and hold them and have a diverse, diverse enough group where I'm okay um, and uh, hedged enough which means I don't really have to be so hedged if I own Saudi and some mining and, and some tech, um, where I don't really care so much what happens to the market every day. And I think that's a, that's a definite way of you know, achieving better returns, but it is embracing more volatility. And uh, I've, I've left the game of trying to uh, you know, out, you know, create alpha and diminish you know, vol you know, for you know, short duration you know, jobs and Incentives. That's definitely what I've, I've I've left. Saudi's unusual because no one, very few people own it. Eventually, everyone's going to own it, and it's a predictable you know amount of money that it's going to have to buy all these stocks that that I own. I understand better than the market, I think. So that's like a special case, and it's not really correlated to a whole lot else in the portfolio. So that's that's where that's how I think about it logically now. But the real story, in my opinion, is how technology is affecting the big parts of the economy and the big sectors. That, I think, is the big, that's my hypothesis for you know, five years from now, we look back and say, I can't believe how much technology affected finance. You know, I, I can't believe how much it's affected the auto sector or education or you know, construction or like really big parts of the, the economy that just haven't changed that much. Um, Healthcare is going to take longer. Um, healthcare is ultimately the greatest good and will change a lot, but it actually is starting from a, a deeply non-information tech place, in my opinion, the provision of healthcare. So it's going to take longer. So I, I would agree with that. And, and um, I mean, we, you, you talked about the human capital aspect, and you've also talked about commodities. And you identified a few areas of commodities where you remain focused, right? I mean. I think what people broadly, from my perspective, underappreciate about the commodity cycle that we encountered um, was that it was, you know, the conditions were set in place by the lack of investment for the 20 years before that. Right. And so when we closed up the capacity, right, if it, I mean, it's very easily explainable if you look at it in hindsight and say, well, we had significant excess capacity that emerged in the 1970s, early 1980s. Right. Um, and as China emerged as a consumer, that capacity utilization tightened up. Right. And by the time you and I came on the scene in the early 2000s, that capacity was such that we were rapidly drawing down inventories and creating a condition in which you needed to allocate the scarce resource on the basis of price. Right? And things like copper or cobalt, um, you highlight the electric vehicle dynamic. I mean, cobalt is primarily used in the cathodes, if I, if I understand the chemistry correctly. And the contribution to an electric vehicle in terms of the price of, of cobalt is immaterial, mm -hmm. right? So, right. you know, you will choose to steal that cobalt by, from somebody else by raising the price that you're offering for, yeah. right? And that shows up as profits and future investment and additional mining. Um, the other side of that, is I think something that's deeply underappreciated. You know, BHP and Rio used to have these charts that showed you know the copper utilization or this iron utilization uh, per capita for China versus mm -hmm. the U.S., yep. Korea, et cetera. And you know, the, those who remain super bullish, those in 2011, 2012, would point to those charts mm -hmm. and say, you know, we've got all this demand ahead of us. Um, but there's a competing force, which is technology, right? And so technology figures out how to use less cobalt or finds a substitute for cobalt or finds a substitute for the first one that, that really began to tumble was nickel, if you remember, yep. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, nickel, the Chinese figured out that you didn't need to use nearly as much yep. um, in terms of the raw material. 
You could create this bastardized thing called Nicropig. Um, and they lowered the price from $20,000 a ton to, I believe it was like $7,000 a ton, right? So, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see somebody who grasps that the two can be related, right? The commodity is not all about, you know, um, you know, metal bending and caterpillar tractors, et cetera. It's also about this idea that technology is a p proceeding apace and raising yeah. the value with which those commodities can be used. I always try to understand what is the big, the biggest picture, the most important, you know, macro change. Um, and I guess I'd say I believe we're operating on legacy platforms throughout our society that that we got we've gotten used to or have changed incrementally, like in our uh, last 20, 30 years. But I have this feeling like we're actually, this, we're on the, like the last days, meaning like there's another, you know, three, five, seven years of these platforms, and then we're moving to totally different platforms. It's like a, it's like a platform shift in technology, like, you know, from mainframe to, you know, to client PCs, server yeah. to cloud right. or whatever. You know, it's like, right. it's very important. And so this is, this is what, this is my hypothesis for what is the big shift. It's that now we're ready, like psychologically, and, and, and we've been trained as consumers, like we're ready to actually adopt broadly to change platforms in all these big sectors. Because the consumer internet companies are the biggest companies, but it's not like they, I mean, e-commerce is changing retail slowly over time, but it's not like they took over massive industries, you know, to be tech industries. It's like they, you know, they, they, they created, you know, the consumers, you know, bought in and enabled, and they enabled this, you know, exchange of value and then this, you know, virality and dominance. But now that the consumer internet companies are the five biggest companies in the world or whatever they are, it's hard for anyone to argue that tech is not essential and, you know, it's, 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 it's the future, but it's those consumer, consumer internet franchises that are those companies. And I believe that, that, the, that we're globally ready to now change, that it's, it's, it's like the risk has been reduced. And so among my in private investing in some of these you know, big old sectors that haven't changed very much, um, I'm putting a lot of time into crypto and blockchain as the tech change in finance. And finance is essentially bigger than healthcare could be measured as being bigger than healthcare and as a percent of GDP. And so it's hard for me to not want to put time into that to test this hypothesis there. I do not think crypto is in isolation and, you know, like actually I think crypto is way more believable and understandable than autonomous driving, you know. Like conceptually, the idea that we're not going to drive our car and we're going to be safer is way harder than the idea of digital currency, right? Well, I mean, it's interesting when you talk about crypto and you refer to it as digital currency, right? Because I think that's that's certainly the image that most people have of crypto, right? Is Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Which which has certainly proven to be a profitable investment um, for many mm -hmm. who have been involved with Ethereum even more so. Yep. But I had somebody explain crypto to me in a really interesting concept, which is that it creates the potential for scarcity in digital assets. Okay, it's true. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, you know, effectively take something, and we, we're all seeing this, right? We're seeing paywalls begin to emerge. We're seeing less free content be available on the consumer web, mm -hmm. right? But for the first time, you're creating the conditions that actually allow you to truly have microtransactions, mm -hmm. right? To have yep. something that is not yep. advertising supported, which is basically a spray and pray sort of approach, mm -hmm. right? Um, you have the potential to create scarcity in digital assets. Um, and it, it's very compelling to me from that standpoint. The idea that it's like currencies well, strikes me as a little difficult. It's, it's going to be a lot of different things, I guess. Um, I think instead of arguing about you know, what it is or what it isn't, I'm saying I think the willingness to change to a new platform is underrated. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is if you believe, if you basically... Um, most of these industries involve some sort of regulatory agreement and, and, a, and a corporate initiative. So, so um, what's fascinating to me, instead of arguing about the technical merits, or it is or it isn't, whatever, 
What's fascinating to me as a global investor, but based here in a tech center for the last you know, 25 years, is the parallel development of crypto around the world and the regulatory, like the, what I see is the recognition on a regulatory basis, it's multi-jurisdictional and essentially competitive, meaning you know, everyone's trying to figure it out together. And even though the, there's such a limited exposure in terms of assets or utility, the awareness is extraordinary. I don't know what to compare it to. So to me, there's this, and it's still really early and it's young, and so it's, it's not mature. It, it, hasn't, it can't actually do what you know, it's going to be able to do. But it's that cultural shift to, a, to being willing and interested to adopt. Um, and you're seeing it, obviously you saw it initially with individuals, fringe and you know, retail and whatever, but on a re it's now a, re it's a regulatory must do everywhere in the world. The buy-in from corporates, the increasing buy-in around the world is, in is extraordinary. And it's, so, it's such immature technology. So it tells me that we're, a different, like, we're at a different stage culturally and globally simultaneously. So you know, it's just, I'm, I'm betting that you, know, you want to leave. You do not want to own value. You know, you, you, we're leaving these systems. Uh, we're going to, you know, um, w technology is only taking on more and more, and yet it's both less accessible and more accessible. I mean, it's less accessible. It's harder to understand. It's hard to understand, you know, innovative technology, you know, as a, analytically. But it's being it's more accessible because it's affecting more of your life, and you're accepting it as affecting more of your life, which is why this autonomous driving, you know, as we move to in these different stages, autonomous driving. It's just, that would have been unthinkable, right? Just a few years ago. It's still hard to believe, but you know we're going there. Um, and so I guess I think this is, this is on a nonlinear path of only more change is happening sooner. And so as a, as a macro thinker, not a technologist, I find the power of that and the externalities of that and the unintended consequences of that really you know, fascinating. And it makes me uh, want to put a lot of my attention into it to see what that means and see what it you know, affects other things. I could say that, that as an individual, a consumer has limited ability to actually do these, you know, be involved in these new platforms in a meaningful way. Um, I you know, know with genomics, you can you go to 23andMe and a few other companies and get some genomic data on, on your own. But you can't get your doctor to treat you that way. They're not, it's not ready to do that. Um, so you can participate, but it's of limited value. But with crypto, I have this hypothesis that people are able to buy it, to touch it, to look at it, to see, you know, participate in it. And it's not only for that in itself. It's, it's like the most accessible thing of, of sort of technology affecting big industries that I think it's liquid. It's, you know, it's, uh, people can, can learn from it. I'd also say because it's liquid, I think there's more information that's being passed around the world in this sector than any, anything else. It makes sense. Because instead of it being like private companies like in a certain region like Silicon Valley where it's hard for the rest of the world to see, like it's hard for me to see into China without actually you know, meaning to be involved in China. Because it's liquid, I think there's a lot of information being passed around about what works and what doesn't. And these new organisms are being introduced into this ecosystem where you get to see you know, and, and, and what works and what doesn't. And it's changing as I'm spending time in it. I'm seeing it change. And I'm, you know, I'm just getting ready for these kinds of changes to be you know, throughout our economy. The, the desire to change is growing, is, is what I'm saying. And, um, and I'm finding it harder to invest you know, fully in the stock market because the stock market actually doesn't get you know, so many of those companies and you know, the the uh, you know, just betting on losers is is hard in a central banking, you know, ever growing central bank driven world, um, and it's hard to own. You know, like crypto is actually a way of participating in leading edge, you know, bleeding edge technology, and so I'm doing that and to to do it for itself to understand it as well as to as part of a broader participation in you know these platform shifts. It's interesting hearing you talk about crypto and doing it um, both eloquently and passionately. Um, so I, I'm a Silicon Valley native, actually grew up 
here when it was still called Santa Clara Valley, uh -huh. um, and had a front row seat to the early uh, you know, home computer environment. I wouldn't even call it the PC movement, right, where you had trash 80s and Vic 20s and you know, mm -hmm. Sinclair 4K machines, et cetera. Um, and before that, even the hobbyists, the Steve Jobs and the, and the Steve Wozniaks uh, of the world. And it was similar in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? Where you couldn't actually do anything with these things, but it was participatory mm -hmm. um, right. in that the technology was rude enough and open enough that lots of different people could do stuff. Right. Now, paradoxically, that also gave me a front row seat to when all that crashed in kind of 84, 85, 86, right? Which occurred alongside the introduction of the IBM PC, mm -hmm. right? Which, you, you know, mm -hmm. most of the world looks at that as if that was, you know, the nascent founding and, and you know, mm -hmm. that's where the PC revolution started. Mm -hmm. But ironically, that was where a wave broke and crashed as uh -huh. well, right? There were lots of competing technologies and lots of competing ideas that suddenly were ossified. And it was like, this is the standard and this is how it goes. Do you see... Think how much riskier it was to invest in stuff back then. Well, it was extraordinarily, uh, it was extraordinarily risky, and many of the early, you know, um, uh, you know, again, people forget Intel is obviously challenged today, but like, you know, it was roughly the time where Intel lost the memory market to the Japanese. That was the real loss there, and everybody was convinced that yeah. Fujitsu was going to dominate the multiprocessor in in the future. Um, didn't work out quite that way, but um, you know, it was much, much riskier. Very similar, huge. Um, interest and and within the community that I grew up in, a huge bubble that was created, um, but then it crashed on a standardization. Is there is there anything out there that you see in crypto that's similar to that standardization moment where people suddenly say, "Aha, this is actually the useful variant." I mean, it could be Ethereum that would effectively make Vitaly Buterin the the king of the world. Um, well, there seems to be there's the store of value you know, use case, which is Bitcoin and a few others, that is as old, you know, a problem as anything. Um, and gold served a, a purpose there. Um, there's payments um, and there's, you know, a few different competing and that's farther behind, but that is a real, you know, benefit because we pay, there's a lot of friction in payments in our society. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's it's really it feels incredibly expensive um, to you know, to have a visa transaction, um, and then there's the smart contracts. You know the technology. What technology will things run on? And there's you know growing competition there. Um, it's so different. Th like I, I have a hard time dismissing the store of value. Um, so I think there's a reason Bitcoin was um, the first thing that was done and has been safe, I guess, a safe bet. Um, and I think it's too early, and there's a lot of um, lessons in the tech world of what ends up winning, right? It's like, where do the developers go? And, you know, you're, a lot of people are making bets on where to put their attention and time. Um, you know, who adopts, who, who gets market adoption? Um, and it's so early uh, there. So, um, and then later applications, I mean, it still feels like it's really early. Um, but as I said, I think because these things are liquid and price, um, price changes is comprehensible to everyone in the world and it changes, potentially changes their behavior of where they're going to put time and what they're going to change, I have a view that it's going to accelerate the market, the transfer of knowledge to what is actually winning formulas and will lead to you know, other you know, magnificent results that say Ethereum had. Ethereum is probably the most spectacular single investment um, that I've seen in my life. And I didn't get a whole lot of it <laughs> in my portfolio. Had I actually just started a year earlier you know, in, in this universe, I, I, I could have had a much greater return. But I'm just saying, like an asset class, this is a platform shift, right? That will grow with time and it's hard to understand. Um, and it's not that I don't have to understand it, but I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I'm learning what the properties are, and what are the potential ramifications, and then what are the effects of it. 
right, as it changes other things and what is the effect of blockchain. But I'm looking at it as the context of this is just one sector, one tech breakthrough that's changing one area, and it's really early. And the same could be said, I said, autonomous driving, you know, in autos, and the same could be said of genomics in healthcare, which is, you know, actually the most incredible, right? I mean, knowing your personal genome and being treated about that is just mind-boggling that it can be delivered to you for less than 100 bucks, you know, like a negligible amount of money. Like, that's incredible. But the healthcare system's not ready to do that. And so my pattern recognition is that we're just on legacy platforms. We're waiting, and I think the culture is ready to change. And so let's just use crypto as, it's in finance, yes, it's, it is in and of itself, but it's also representative and the most accessible of all the new technology platforms for consumers. And it's happening and it's accessible around the world at the same time. I think Asians are, like culture are taking to it much better or faster than, than we are in the West. But I'm, you know, I'm ready for you know, big changes in security tokens, for instance. But I don't need to be precise. You know? and with the duration, you don't need to be as precise as you do in you know, managing low vol public market uh, funds. I do think this is the big trend. I'm looking for the, something that is bigger than this. And maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe it's going to take longer for these shifts to happen. But as I put in the time, I just think this is a representative of a bigger um, perception change around the world. And now I think the risk is not doing. Like the corporate risk is not you know, adopting and getting closer to this, like take, take blockchain. That's my perception. And regulatory, as much as China has stopped it temporarily, the risk is you, you ban it and then you, your human capital you know, goes and builds systems in other places, other, other jurisdictions. That's my view. Um, so that's a pretty big thing, you know. I would agree with that. And I, again, you mentioned before that you know the the you know the right brain is 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 uh, you know a pattern recognition uh, tool, and the left brain is you know working on something very very differently, right? Um, one of the challenges I think that people have when you have this type of innovation, and I certainly struggle with it. Is that you want to draw the historical analogy? Yeah. Right. So you know when you yes. hear smart contracts, you're like, oh, okay, they're going to replace lawyers in the negotiation of your uh, of your mortgage, or they're going to replace lawyers in the negotiation of large scale M and A. Well, you know the the irony is is that large scale M and A is it has solutions that are incredibly expensive, but they're as, as a fraction of the total mm -hmm. purchase price. It's relatively yep. small, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, what tends to happen is when you have that type of um, technology emerge is that contracts proliferate, right? And you engage in contracts, a smart contract enters into something that you never thought of before, right? You know, a magazine yeah. subscription is technically yeah. a contract, right? right. And it's right. not worth litigating on either right. side, but right. it's certainly one way of dealing with it. And right. as we, we moved into the internet era, and I don't mean to stick on the advertising, you know, example, but as we moved into the internet era, a magazine subscription was not something that anyone was going to litigate with you about, did you improperly access my website? And so you chose the next best choice, right? Which is, well, we'll just make it available to everybody and we'll do so by advertising, right? And so then the advertising networks exploded in value, right? Um, if you move into something like smart contracts where I can actually re-enter into a magazine contract, that may be very real risk for some of these technology leaders that, that you were highlighting before. You can only see so much of the picture, you know, and if you need to, to wait, it's like the, it's a, polar, it's a Polaroid, right? You're, you can, it's, it's changing in front of your eyes, but it's still very fuzzy. It's like, do you have to wait until it's a full, you know, full on perfect, as good as it's gonna get picture before you say, okay, I'm going to, you know, participate, invest, you know, learn. Or do you say, okay, I've seen enough to say this is going to turn into, you know, probability is going to turn into a, a picture that I like, and others will see it, and others will follow, and adoption will happen. I mean, with crypto, I think it's, it's basically, I see it's changing finance in startups. I, you know, I see public companies looking at it. I see all these um, potential securities that could be security tokens that wouldn't be public companies, but have you know benefits to create um, holders of, of, of these and there's a reason why you know it should be liquid more liquid than it is I guess I'd say that I've seen enough I'm putting time in to say 
I think this will turn into, this will develop into something much more meaningful. And by seeing what it's going to become before the market is, you know, 101 on investing, right? It's saying, oh my God, you should invest in this company, this asset class, this place, this, this whatever. And again, I'm, but I'm using this as partly as, a, as the most liquid um, uh, and the most, um, I think, globally interesting right now. Uh, it's like the vanguard of what's happening in, in every old sector. And finance is a big one. And so I'm looking at it like I'm, it's not only for what it is and, and what it'll become. It's the adoption is also a, is a cultural, like that, that rate is also helping me see the rate of change in many other things. Uh, those are the things that aren't very liquid and, and, are, and may involve more regulatory or, or more gatekeepers like in, like in healthcare. So it'll, it's starting in finance, it'll end in commerce for a lot of this. And it'll be very, you know, very volatile and there'll be lots of losers, but there'll also be, I think, more enormous winners in the asset class than any, anywhere else, I think. And I think if I'm right that the being liquid and being globally developed at the same time, I think it's going to compress the time it takes to actually get from, you know, oh my gosh, what is this to, oh, that's the solution for, you know, some, you know, vertical need or horizontal need or whatever. So that gives you, if that's correct, then it actually the chance of appreciation is higher here than in most other um, asset classes even though it's already risen, a lot of it's already risen so much. And it's hard to keep up with, it's very hard. It's, it's just, it's, it's so much to keep up with. But I, by putting time into it, I feel like I'm putting a time into the main change happening in society. And I'm expecting five years from now, we'll be surprised how much we were willing to shift our behavior because others were willing to shift their behavior because we've had the iPhone for 11 years and social media for whatever, 15 years or whatever it's been longer. Um, and I think we all were trained, we were like socialized to, you know, we, we, we can't imagine not having our phones. We can't imagine not having our, you know, platforms that we depend on. And now I think we're, as in, in groups, going to make the corporates change and the regulatory bodies change. And I just think we just weren't ready to change this way. So maybe I'm gonna be wrong by a few years, but maybe not, maybe, so if you think that, like, how do you, what do you do? You know, and, and what is the best way to take advantage of it is my question. You know, is it tr through traditional equities? It's hard to get there for, at this valuation with the uncertainties of central banking with the, you know, the sort of the lack of like leading edge early stage technology that because companies just don't go public that, that often. And the, particularly if they're not dependable, you know, dependably, you know, growing. So... Anyway, it's, this led me to want to spend a lot more time in what are fringe markets, you know, like crypto, or in private markets like uh, like venture. And yet, I find that it's just growing. You know, I'm finding China is a totally separate market from the U.S. now, and to access that, you have to go through a different path. But I don't know anything bigger than this. I wish I'd been. I wish I'd understood central, what central banking was really going to mean. You know two asset prices, I had a hypothesis that could happen, but I just didn't bet on it happening. This I'm, I'm betting my you know, attention and, and, uh, and professional time and personal capital, and, and if I'm right, then it'll grow into an institutional you know, thing, and everything we're doing at Passport on the crypto side is an institutional, it's like we're trying to be the most institutional, sophisticated partner to the ecosystem, but also, you know, investor for institutions when they ever de decide to invest. Right now, family offices want to invest and almost no one else does. So, and we'll see, we'll see. I think it's gonna change faster, but I'm, this is me learning, you know, me learning for my, what I think is important, but I'm not like an expert evaluator of technology either. You mentioned this, this interesting dichotomy that exists, right, where paradoxically, Markets are at all-time highs, and yet, as you point out, many of the platforms on which valuations are built or on which business models are built, you think are going to change with relative rapidity, right? So if we're looking at a five to six years, right, the, the competitive advantage period for many of these corporations um, that enjoy very robust valuations are, are, are very much at risk. Um, how do you, you know, 
segue for a second. How do you how do you reconcile that? And secondly, you know, you've offered um, a very clear articulation of the challenges that you had in making the transition within the public markets, and you're much more interested, and you've been um, extraordinarily successful on the private side. Um, what do you think is the core challenge that the traditional hedge fund manager is facing or that the industry is facing in terms of alpha generation? You know, what, why do you think it's changing? Why, why do you think it's been so difficult? Well, I like to say that uh, you know, I, I want to invest in things that have never happened before and I look for you know, the, the things that haven't happened before because that's not going to be priced correctly. And I guess what wasn't priced correctly was the was the you know absolute continuation you know in growth of of, of liquidity, um, and I'd say also the um, you've had the you know the at least for the S and P uh, you know tech is taking on more and more and leading tech companies which are you know not very sensitive uh, to the economy I'd say, um, and also I guess I if I if I had to use a positive a non like you know, rigged system view. I'd say that that um, if tech is if globalization, but then really tech is generating more and more information, right? That's usable. You could say that is actually being pulled into corporates, right? In the in in the U.S. and developed world, increasingly to their benefit in one way or another, making them more efficient. And so, I guess the lack of recession or recession qualities, the lack of you know, liquidity drain, and this slow increasing of, of ability to, to you know, make use of not only tax advantages, but data, leads me to think, okay, so until it cracks, who knows where it goes? The problem is I just can't depend on my analysis of central bankers of when they will or won't, like, like you know, the, the Fed not hiking last meeting. Like I don't understand that. You know, I. But that's that's like the hazard you have here. You're, you're you know, like it's a binary bet. They either do tighten, you know, more than the market thinks, and things go down, or they don't, and those same things go up, and you have short duration capital, and you have one result or the other. You know, it's, it's very, you know, it's very, uh, it's very hard. Um, so I just I've decided I do not want my the outcome of my bets to be dependent on getting the central banks right, no matter how much time I've put into it. And yes, it may be the tightening here is going to lead to, you know, 20, 25% lower, but I'm not counting on that. I'm really not. I do think that the increasing amounts of data and the, the availability of opportunity and the growth of tech, higher margin businesses is just going to keep going. Um, but I'm also captivated by these, these platforms that these, these platform shifts that you can't access through public equities. And I want to be closer to that. I want to understand them. And if I put all my time into trading public equities, I'm, I'm starving you know, myself of understanding these other things. So I've decided, I decided um, that it is changing. And I can understand some reasons, but some maybe I can't. And I'm just I'm going to back away from that and adopt other means. Ultimately, you know, a high return on capital for the longer duration is what you seek as an investor. So I'm seeking those things where I can get that and get that transfer of information to my head to understand, oh, this is the way it's going. Maybe I do other things with that. But uh, attention is a, big, is a big concern of mine. You know, we all have the same amount of attention, basically. And so the inertia of maintain, you get paid for doing jobs and things that are you know seem to be losing value in financial markets, and so I think taking them to zero is part of the process to, you know, grow your attention in the places that are uncertain, but are going to be you know in the future very impactful. That's what I'm doing with crypto. I'm not saying I know, you know, I can out analyze these things. I'm saying I think this is the this is like the the liquid tip of a massive platform shift that we're that we're doing. Yet it's really early, and so I don't want to challenge it too much. Just an uh, analogy I use is, you know, you you don't evaluate kids on what they can do right now. You're evaluating, you know, early technologies and and and, and young people with what you think their capabilities are later, right? You know, they're they're or athletes or whatever. It's relative to 
the norm and relative to expectations. And so I'd say, um, you know, with, with the, the crypto and blockchain, it's just so sudden that our attention is there and they're, it's too, too early to actually accomplish the things that, you know, that you think they can, just like young people can't accomplish what they can accomplish when they're 25 or 35. And so, you know, but, I, but you, if you could, you definitely want to bet on, you know, the best soccer player and bet on the best, you know, math, <laughs> the math lead, you know, or the best whatever, the best piano player. So I'm looking at this as like, uh, but this is the, this human capital is also taking society, a society that's willing to be taken to places they didn't think it was going to go. And so it's hard, to, it's hard for me to consider a bigger trend than that as an investor. Areas that you and I very deeply agree are in the primacy of human capital and the importance of that. And one of the things I would point out um, that I think is just a fascinating little tidbit um, is right about the time that you're talking about your epiphany in 2011 um, is the date, actually, that, that uh, many, um, much of the research in China indicates, actually, that their labor force began to contract. Oh, that's right. right? And so it's, it's a very intuitive, obviously, you weren't looking at that data. Um, but for me, that was certainly something I was monitoring quite closely in that the minute you exhausted that huge excess labor supply, mm. suddenly the value of human capital began to rise. Mm. Right? And you saw this, I would argue, across the world. Mm-hmm. It was camouflaged in a lot of ways. You had models like Uber, et cetera, that were brought in when human capital was in surplus in 2008. Um, but things began to change rapidly. And today mm-hmm. you're seeing the lowest unemployment rates we've seen in a long time mm-hmm. uh, across the developed world. Right? And those who can efficiently utilize human capital are really in a much stronger position than those who are struggling. I've, and I'm also seeing that um, other parts of America are now, you know, they're learning, right? They're changing. They're adopting more of the, what's made you know, Silicon Valley you know, do so, or the West Coast do so well. I mean, like the attention is on what has worked and how things are, are, are changing. I'm just... I'm just prepared for five years from now, we'll look back and say, oh my God, like, can you believe you didn't invest or you didn't do, you know, these things that were emerging? I don't want to, I I want to be involved in those things, even though there's uncertainties, because I want to learn like these essential truths of, oh gosh, this is what's going to happen. And therefore I can, you know, put capital again in that asset class, that company, that place, that whatever. And I, I, Weirdly, I think leaving leaving the stock market more alone than I did is actually part of the answer to get over the inertia of attention and obligation fiduci- on a fiduciary basis and to put more attention into these these emerging platforms that will really change our lives. That's that's and I, I don't know when that's going to end. I, I don't think it's ever going to end, but it's it, again, it's a fascinating contrast, right? Because if you think about what you're saying, you're saying all that we know is about to change radically. Mm-hmm. And yet- Because we didn't have the information. We did, well, we didn't have the information, but paradoxically, particularly in the markets, and this is where I spend 100% of my time right now, um, more capital than ever before, right, by, by orders of magnitude, is actually now managed on the basis of what right. happened in the past. Right. Um, and what we can derive from empirical finance, right? The, the, you know, the Schiller Nobel Prize in 2013. If we look at the history, right? Fama, uh, Eugene Fama also benefited from this, right? The, the factor-based investing, right? If we just look at what happened to the past history in terms of price action, um, we can divine the future, hmm. right? And that's a, you know 65 plus percent of the market is in these types of strategies. And right. In my opinion. Um, you're very correctly articulating that what's happening in price right now is a distraction and that increasingly it is disassociating itself from what that forward trajectory is going to look like. Um, and it's, it's amazing to hear somebody with your stature you know, and your experience being able to articulate that in terms of the focus and saying, I needed to put that aside and now I'm looking at what's going forward. If central banks weren't part of the equation, it would be a lot more interesting because, right, there'd be the normal feedback loop of millions of people and, you know, hundreds of thousands of businesses making decisions that have a normal, you know, seasonal quality to it. 
it's felt like we, you know, we're living in a very balmy, <laughs> we're, we're not in a four season world now in the markets. We're in a, we're in San Diego, you know, we're, it's like, it's, they're just keeping the temperature and, you know, uh, pretty good. And they, I think it's because they realize that they can't create inflation as easily as they thought. And that was just not in their models. And so they're, they're finding, oh my God, I can put a lot more liquidity and compensate for this. And it's not actually causing bad things. Now, I know there's some inflation and I don't think it's going to be, you know, last a long time. It could be wrong. Demographically, I don't th think that's the case. And, and technology is a deflationary force. But I just think that's not the biggest thing. Like, we're, we're in this era. We're not in a previous era. We're not, in, you know, we're not in the Warren Buffett time of buying consumer stocks. You know? We're not in the beginning of the internet era. We're not in the crisis era. You know, we're not even five years ago when before consumer internet franchises were you know, repriced. We're in this era. Like, what should we do with our time now? You know, how should we you know, benefit intellectually and, 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 and financially from what's going to happen in the next five years. That's, that's what I'm trying to pay attention to. And I think everyone should try to pay attention. It's just that in this case, abandoning what pays you, you know, current income may be part of the solution to put, to, you know, re reprice your own attention into something that doesn't seem like it's that hopeful. It's a lot like leaving your corporate job and start doing a startup, actually, right? You, 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 it's the same kind of thing. But if you're right, then that's where the money is. That's where, you know, that's where everyone's going to be well served for it. It's just, I think it's, it's going to all happen sooner than you think because of the structural, you know, the just reality of, of, of tech and the release of all this information and the cultural willingness, I think, to go to the next platform. That's what I think. That's, I think, where we are. Well, you bring up five years, you bring up willingness. Um, I don't want it to be five years, but hopefully you're willing to sit down in the interim and we can follow up on some of these themes and see how it's developing. Great. John, thank you again. Okay, I appreciate thanks. it.